Okay, I think we can we can start the ball rolling. Welcome to Open Democracy's weekly live discussion. My name is Peter Gagan, and I'm the editor in chief here at Open Democracy. And we want this conversation to involve you as much as possible. And so, thanks in particular to all of you who submitted questions and comments ahead of time. And we're going to address as many of these in the course of the next 50 minutes or so as we can. And if you're joining us on Zoom and you have a question or comment for us, click on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen and type into the chat window. For those of you who are watching, watching on Facebook, you can put your questions in the comments. And I'm really, really excited to have a fantastic panel here to discuss what is a, I think is a really, really important uh, subject and will be both now and for the years to come really. And that's the future really of the BBC. You know, what's going to be left of the BBC in 2028 is the question we posed in this, uh, at the start of this, um, at the start of this webinar. But in many ways, it's probably what's going to be left of the BBC into the future. What's the future of public broadcasting look like? You know, will the market now rule all for broadcasting? You know, would that be a bad thing? Is there going to be, is there a possibility of alternative versions for the future of the BBC and in general public broadcasting? across the United Kingdom. And I think these are, you know, given some of the political machinations on the BBC and kind of threats to the BBC's future, the license fee now seems to be a great time to be asking this question. So thank you very much for coming along. And I'm really, really excited to have a fantastic panel here to discuss it. We were joined by David Elstein, who's the former director of programmes at Thames, the head of programming at B-Sky-B and the former chief executive of Channel 5 at its launch. We also have Lindsay Mackey, who's a writer and partner in the New Weather Institute, which examines social and economic alternatives to neoliberalism, and who has written uh, a lot about public broadcasting, including, I'm very pleased to see, for us here at Open Democracy. And we've also, last but by no means least, we've got Marcus Ryder, who's a head of external consultancies at the Sir Lenny Henry Centre for Media Diversity and the chair of RADA. He's also a former BBC News and Current Affairs executive having worked for the corporation for 24 years. And Marcus, I must say, looking at you in front of me today, I cannot believe you worked anywhere for 24 years, but I'm going to believe you. And so great, you know, thanks, thanks everyone for joining. And, you know, please do see someone, uh, Nina's already said, good evening, someone said, by all means, tell us where you are in the world. Uh, I'm here in, well, it was sunny Dalston in East London until quite recently. Um, and yeah, please, please, by all means, let us know where you are too. Um, I'm just going to kick off this uh, this webinar by, in some ways, asking the obvious question. You know, and against the backdrop recently of uh, Nadine Doris saying that this is going to be the last license fee, the culture secretary, the last license fee for the BBC, and saying that we're going to move to a different model of public service broadcasting in the United Kingdom. I guess what will be left of the BBC in 2028? 20, what what do we think? Anti the great British corporation is going to look like. You know, what, 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 and what what might we want it to look like? And I think. You know, I'm, going to, I'm going to go to the panel as I can see them in front of me. So, Lindsay, I'm going to ask you that question first. What do you think the BBC should look, will look like in 2028? Well, it's, two, it's two different questions, isn't it, Peter? It's what might it look like and what should it look like? And I'm going to do what should it look like first, because and I think, possibly controversially, it should be bigger, it should be better funded, um, and it should have... A, almost a greater role and not an exclusive role in public information and public education, if you like, um, but not at the expense of drama and entertainment and what sport it can get its hands on and so on. Um, what it, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there on, the, on that one part of the answer. The other is, if we have this government, if we have a government that is led by Boris Johnson, um, but is fairly right wing and, and does these, uh, seems to make antipathetic policy towards the BBC on the hoof, which is what Nadine Doris seemed to have done and then she wrote back about the last fee. I really dread that prospect and I think it's probably up to us to, to mount a campaign, campaigns to actually save the BBC, which is an extraordinary thing to say about a British institution that's last 100 years. But so those are the two answers. One. I would like it to be bigger, better, more trusted. I'd like a government that actually supported it, um, but didn't control it. Um, but it might be a very paltry, abused, frightened institution if we're not careful. David, um, 
I have a feeling you might have a different perspective on where you'd like to see the BBC go. What What do you think? What would you What would, Where would you like? What would you like to see by by twenty twenty eight? I absolutely share Lindsay's hopes uh, for the BBC. I would. <clears throat> I would hope in 2028 it will be uh, bigger and better and bolder than it is now, uh, that it will have resolved uh, a, a funding conundrum, which uh, the answer to which has been available for 35 years uh, and was provided by the Peacock Committee in 1986. Um, endorsed by uh, the Burns Committee in 2006, endorsed by uh, the Davis Report in 1999, endorsed by the House of Commons Select Committee on Media in 2015, um, which is uh, to split the BBC's uh, revenue uh, flows into two, uh, one of them being to support public service content, across the range of news, current affairs, uh, education, children's, uh, regional programming, uh, religion, uh, some documentaries and arts, and all of that to be funded through direct taxation, just as the rest of public service broadcasting on ITV, Channel 4 and other broadcasters should be so funded. Uh, and that would include radio and world service radio, as was funded through government resources until very recently. Uh, and the rest of the BBC would be dynamically funded by subscription. Uh, it's been sitting there for a long time. The BBC itself said back in 1985 that the best way of being funded was subscription, mostly because it gets you out of the government completely. You never have to talk to the government again about money. Secondly, it gets rid of license fee evasion and prosecution, which is a political burden that the BBC could do without. And thirdly, because it's so flexible. If you look at uh, the number of subscription services that the BBC already runs, it's got 14 subscription channels in the UK TV umbrella. It knows how to run. BBC Entertainment, BBC Drama, BBC Sport, BBC Arts, BBC Documentaries. And that would give it a much more buoyant uh, revenue base and one which was much more easily monetizable globally. Uh, at the moment, the BBC is very restricted in how it deploys its IP globally and it has to sell finished programs. Netflix is available in 160 different countries. That's how it builds its buoyancy even something like HBO is available in 50 or 60 so I've got high hopes of the BBC provided we don't get completely hung up on it's the license for or it's nothing thank you very much for that David thanks it's a very interesting interjection uh, Marcus what's your take on it um okay controversially I think we get hung up on the BBC um too much I think that the conversation should be what does, and David um, alluded to this, what does publicly funded broadcasting and content look like? You know, and how much public money should actually go into that? And then we can have a sensible conversation um, as to whether the best way, once we've decided the amount of public money that should go into that, um, whether the BBC is the best way to deliver that content. There's some really interesting small models, such as the Youth Audience Content Fund, um, such as the Audio Content Fund, which is looks like it's about to run its path um, after three years, you know. But the uh, sometimes I feel that we get slightly hung up on what is the BBC, what's the shape of the BBC, as if it's the only way that we deliver um, publicly funded broadcasting and content. BBC is very important, but I think any discussion around the BBC must look at other international models of how you deliver Germany for one. And what also gets muddled up for me is the BBC is a global player, it's a national player, and it's a local player, right? Um, delivering local content as well, regional content as well. And we've got to also 
discuss all three of those address different market failures and they address different um uh, different roles in which public service broadcasting and public content can fill those gaps and sometimes it just all gets into one big mush and so i think it's really important that we try and draw those different threads out in these discussions i've kind of avoided your question completely i've got no idea what the bbc is going to look like in 2028 it's interesting. I was actually just thinking that, reflecting on it, having posed this question to start, I feel like none of us have actually grappled with that. And I wonder, Lindsay, I might almost just push you to go and ask, having said what, you said, what it should look like, what, where, where do you think it is going to look like? Where do you think we are looking at right now in terms of like what is likely to happen? Well, I don't think, see, I, I do dis, I disagree with, I'm afraid, with David about subscription models. Um, and also Peacock, I thought that Peacock had said, you know, we're, we're License fee is pretty, pretty cool, pr pretty fair. It does, it does its job at the moment. I mean, things have changed dramatically. I think, I think we may, in, all right, I think we may be in danger of still talking about how to fund the BBC in 2028 after the charter discussions and so on. We still may be talking about funding. And I honestly think that we have to talk about, we have to talk about the role of the BBC and the public service broadcasting environment or ecosystem in the changed world we find ourselves in and I think I mean I don't I don't think I can answer the question what will it look like unless we take into account how strongly people feel about the BBC and the desire to protect it because it might be it might be that this government that the right-wing media very powerful might and people nationally in Scotland, they're quite anti-BBC in some ways. You know, the union may not hold. It may be that the BBC in 2028 looks very diminished. And it's a strong possibility if we don't, if we don't defend it. And if we don't defend its universality, which is the problem with subscription, you do away with universality of access. If we don't defend its scope, if we don't defend the need for a and an organization that has huge resources to combat disinformation and all the all the research that we have from Reuters and um, America and, and Claire Wardle in New, in New York is that an organization like the BBC can defend the country and defend the world against disinformation and that's the new threat which so I'm still not I'm like Marcus I'm not answering your question I'm sorry but I, th I think there's something that I want to pick up on with regards to to Scotland, I'm sitting in Glasgow right now, right? And so one, we should remember in 2014, one of the major issues that possibly was an influence, not, it wouldn't say it, it swayed the independence vote, but there was a real discussion as to whether they'd be able to get access in Scotland um, to EastEnders, right? And so the, the fact that that could actually be a factor in how you vote shows how important the BBC is in people's cultural life and how it is a political hot potato if people feel that some of their beloved programs are, are under threat. That's point one. Point two, and this goes to my original point, is even if you say that people, some people are in Scotland are against the BBC or don't like the BBC, they're not against public service broadcasting. Right? And, so, and that's very different. And so they would actually like to take that money and put it into a Scottish broadcasting corporation. Now, on an international level, there's no way that a Scottish broadcasting corporation, for example, would have the same clout and power of a BBC. But we've then got to ask ourselves, do we want it to? You know, and if we, if we want it to, then that's a good argument for maintaining the BBC, and maybe that's what you need to maintain. If you don't want it to, and you want better local services, you know, maybe a, a SBC and similarly uh, something for Manchester and a more regional model might be better. The problem that I have is that we're not having those discussions. So personally, I actually want more money, maybe for selfish reasons, I want more public money to go into public service broadcasting, right? But the debate is constantly BBC or nothing. It's as if we can't separate the idea of BBC and public service broadcasting. I, I strongly agree with Marcus. Um, there's, um, I've been a supporter of a, a Scottish Broadcasting Corporation for many years and have 
spoken publicly in uh, in Scotland in favour of it. And uh, it's, it's the issue of public service broadcasting is actually a critical one. Public service broadcasting, as uh, charted by um, uh, Ofcom, year after year after year in reports starting from 2005 all the way up to uh, 2018, has what Ofcom has traced is a catastrophic fall in the amount of public service content that's being delivered by British Broadcasting, including by the BBC, as they prioritise entertainment over public service content. And it, it, the uh, failure of the BBC, um, or rather the uh, uh, pressures on the BBC to imitate what goes on in the commercial world is what has driven this failure. Obviously, there's been a failure of legislation, there's been a failure of political will, there's been a failure of regulation, but most of all, there's been a failure of imagination at the political level as to how to deal with this. And as I said, Peacock got this right in 1985, and the House of Commons got it right in 2015. You have two different kinds of output. And even within public service content output, you have national output, regional output, local output. You have um, uh, radio, you have television, you have online. All that needs to be properly funded, properly administered, and not run by the broadcasters. At the moment, we hand over £3.6 billion a year to the BBC and hope, we cross our fingers and hope to get some public service content. We get some. I would say about 20 to 25% of BBC output is public service content. That's quite high. It, should be it high. is quite high. It's much lower with other broadcasters, but it's still a, a stupid way to go about it. Why would you uh, penalise 150,000 uh, poverty-stricken single mothers for failing to fund BBC News? That, it's not their responsibility. That's a, that's a central responsibility, a social responsibility. We should have the correct amount of funding for all the public service content that we want. And it shouldn't be run by politicians. It should have a separate body that runs it. And it shouldn't be run by the broadcasters who cannot be trusted and have proven that they cannot be trusted. Now, all of that content, everything funded uh, through uh, public resources has to be universally available, free to air, etc. It is not important to the future of public service broadcasting whether Homes Under the Hammer is on a subscriber service or not. It's a completely different issue. Even EastEnders, uh, absolutely uh, possible to fund that through uh, a properly commercial system. Uh, so, uh, well, someone's at my front door. Um, the, uh, can, I, can, I just, uh, can I just... Sorry, can I Lindsay. Could you answer your front door? Um, but I, I do think it's very important to say that actually EastEnders and Strictly and whatever, you know, other popular programmes, they are part of the national fabric. They're part of people talking to each other. They're part of shared experience. And it's completely wrong. It's completely wrong, I think, to siphon those off to paid for you can pay for it and talk about 150,000 single mothers they're not going to be able to afford strictly and what but why should they be forced to pay for it but they're not if they can't they're, afford it you want to no, force them no, no, to pay for something they can't afford no absolutely not if you look at what what sky i mean the, the license fee is actually it's quite a cheap way of funding this and we not know compared with netflix it isn't but Netflix has something like 127 hours of programming. You, you oh, 31,000 hours of drama programming on Netflix and Amazon. No. Hundreds of hours of UK product. Right. And it cost me £10 a month. The BBC cost me £700 a year. I do, that's a, well, it only cost me... That's because I have a second home. Have, Netflix, uh, I can get them I in both homes. I can't watch I, can't I can't watch two TVs at the same time and Netflix have correctly 
allow me to say which one I'm watching. The BBC won't. But universal, to the serious point is universal access to you know, inform, educate, entertain, which were the BBC's founding principles. And I still think they are incredibly important. And I think it's so unfair to say, well, Strictly is not very good for you. It's fun, but you'll have to pay for that. But you're going to get news at 10 or um, the weather program on, on a, a modified or tiny um, license fee. I think that's crazy. And also you're, you're setting up a hugely bureaucratic edifice to sort of decide between this and that, you know? It's not difficult. We've known what the categories are for 80 years. We've known exactly what they are. And Ofcom has told us exactly what they are time after time after time since 2003. So there's no argument about categories. The only argument is, should people be threatened with prosecution for failing to pay for Strictly Come Dancing? Give yeah. them the choice. Everyone is able to do it. 60% of people in this country freely subscribe to Netflix, 70% to Sky or Virgin Media. Nobody is threatened with jail. See, um, my, uh, yes, my problem with the parallel with, with Netflix is that, and there's lots of, I mean, anything close scrutiny, any parallel can, can fall down under close scrutiny. But my, my, but my biggest problem is with the exception of people who have two homes, you know, nice if you can get it, David, right? But with the exception of people with two homes, the person who is on minimum wage is paying the same for Netflix as the person who has two homes-ish, right, is paying for Netflix, right? And uh, although I had, a, I had a brief Twitter chat with somebody who was trying to argue that the license fee isn't a tax, for all intents and purposes, even the government recognises it's a tax, right? And so as such, we very, very rarely, I can't think of any other instance where you get nice, quote-unquote, liberal people trying to argue for a regressive tax, mm -hmm. right? We should, in our tax system, look for a progressive tax, right? And so I would say that while I can't think of, you know, it, what David is suggesting is interesting. I haven't really looked at that. So, but splitting it up is, is definitely an interesting in model. But I think that any funding where you're asking people to pay a tax or a subscription for public good, Right, which is provided by the government or whatever, which is a equivalent of a tax, um, there should be some element of um, it being progressive. Can I add one extra thing here, which goes back to something Marcus was saying earlier about uh, the BBC wrapping up lots of different things in one identity. In Sweden, um, public service television and public service radio are completely separate. They're funded uh, through the same pot, but they are uh, administratively completely different. And that's very healthy because it means you have two different um, editorial teams pondering over what is the news, what should be at the top of the news, etc. cetera. Uh, it would actually probably be good for World Service Radio to go back to being an independent institution just looking outwards, not looking inwards, and not being run for a new broadcasting house. I think it would be good for BBC television and BBC radio to be uh, split up. I would like to see far more autonomy for uh, the BBC regions uh, and for the nations, for Scotland, for Northern Ireland, uh, for Wales and so forth. I, and that's why it worries me not in the least to see an option of BBC public service content being separately funded from BBC entertainment and allowing the BBC to do, to, to uh, stop trying to be two different things at the same time, but to allow specialization. Be much more public service by working in the public service area. That's one of the things that I learned when I was at the BBC. I worked in uh, a specialist public service area and current affairs. Uh, and it, the discipline of just focusing on that rather than on what was on BBC One on Saturday night was very healthy. And I think it would be much better for the entertainment people to try and sort out 
what they could make for the audience that the audience wanted and to try and think through uh, how to wrap up all the different kinds of um, uh, commercial product that uh, they could deliver uh, and differentiate between uh, the types of things. But you could also have crossover. So for instance, BBC uh, Entertainment produces EastEnders uh, as a commercial product for its subscribers, but it also licenses it thanks to a grant from the Public Service Fund to BBC a day later or two days later. Um, BBC Sport bids for high-end premium sports content, but it also packages it up highlights packages, which it sells to the public service broadcaster. So what you would get is a much more rational way of running broadcasting businesses and broadcasting institutions. And you would also uh, devolve far more. Instead of having one great big BBC, you'd have a far more devolved version of the BBC and uh, allow power to slide away from the centre. Lindsay, I'll, 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 I'll take you in for a second and I might ask one or two more questions as well. Go on, but Lindsay, I'll, I'll give you a chance to pop in there. No, I'm just thinking what, what you have is not the BBC. You do not have this large national institution with institutional memory, with uh, trust mm -hmm. ratings which are unequaled anywhere in the world. You do not have a BBC on your model. If that's if that's what you know, and, and maybe you know, that's BBC BBC is trusted in America. It's not particularly trusted here. No more than ITV. No more than Channel Four. No more than Sky. Well, it's it's the same level. Seventy two percent trust level. No, it's much. It's it's in things like the pandemic. It's much. It's much more watched. It's much more the the the, the news programs on the BBC are lead by a substantial lead over other channels including among young people. And that's uh, why, I, uh, and it's, and it's, it's half it the true. experience actually wins out. So I, I, I just think that, that what we should be looking at is what this great institution is capable of, that it's not doing, not let's break it up and that'll be better. But that's my... Yeah, I, I, I often hear the argument, right, that the BBC is so trusted and is what is turned to in times of the pandemic or, or national emergencies. My understanding is that state broadcasters, right, of which the BBC is not a state broadcaster, I hasten to add, but state broadcasters across the world are what people generally turn to in their country at times of pandem pandemic and national emergency because it's basically like tuning into to the government to find out what's what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I normally take the argument of the BBC is the one that's tuned into at times of national crisis um, with, with a pinch of salt. I, I believe it's true, but I think state broadcasters yeah. play that role and we definitely don't want the BBC to become a state broadcaster. So I'm, I'm not always sure of that argument myself. Yeah. Um, but I think my experience, having worked, and I can definitely vouch that, Peter, that I have worked, I did work at the BBC for 24 years, um, that sometimes the, the BBC model can seem like an answer looking for a problem, right? And what I mean by that is I remember back in the, the 90s, the general argument is that you needed to have a, a channel or you need to have channels with mixed bags, you needed EastEnders, um, you needed to have a bit of science, you needed to have a bit of comedy, you had, needed to have a bit of news, because if you had that mi mixed bag, then that was why people would then watch the news, because they'll watch, off the, back, they'll watch the Panorama probe investigation off the back of EastEnders, where if you only just had the Panorama by itself, you wouldn't watch it, right? Due to um, streaming and the non-digital and the sorry, and the digital nature of how we watch television and our viewing habits, our viewing habits and how we view and consume content now is radically changing, right? And so, but I still feel as if some of the same arguments are being had as to why we need this, this mixed bag. Now, I'm not saying we don't, but 
I get nervous that we seem to have a very similar model to what we had back in 90, when I started the BBC, back in 92, right, as we have now. And we know that our consumption habits and we know that the industry has changed radically, right? And so I'm nervous that we're, that we are not trying to think of a new way of reimagining. The problem is that sometimes it's hard to have these discussions because it's difficult to tell whether we're really engaging with other people in, in good faith, whether there are bad faith actors who, when you're engaging with those discussions, their goal is really to massively diminish um, public funding into public, into public broadcasting. Mm. And so th that's the trouble. I really want a sensible conversation mm. where about the BBC, about public service broadcasting, about public funding of it and how to fund it without having to be seen as champion of the BBC or person who wants to tear down the BBC. You know, it's, it's, it's a binary which... It's is caught, it's debate, doesn't it? It's, it's got horribly caught. You're right. Well, one thing that kind of struck me, and from what you said there, Marcus, and, and actually in general, a lot of discussion around the BBC is there's, there's almost two bits of one, two bits I want to probe a little bit more. One is actually the first thing that you, one of the things you said there, Marcus, as well about um, you know, about how people are consuming content, and you know, I'm aware that you know younger people don't watch linear television in any numbers at all really frankly you know this and it feels actually like something that's missing from this debate including in our panel actually is is younger voices and younger people i'm wondering how that's going to change what public service broadcasting could and should look like but whether it's 2028 or way beyond beyond that like you know how and in what format should we be trying to accommodate and think about that so we're not just creating things that exist for the people who, a bit like the same as the media industry, for the people who still buy newspapers or the people who still watch linear television. Is there a danger that we're going to, we're doing that? Well, of course. Marcus, wanna, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, all, all I was going to say is uh, Ofcom has been charting this in its um, uh, annual reports on media consumption. Uh, and uh, 16 to 34, it's a large proportion of them, uh, last year said they would have given up linear television by 2024, over 30% of them. Uh, you, you're, when you drill down to the 16 to 24s, they watch very little uh, linear television. Uh, they watch vastly more YouTube than they watch the iPlayer. And they actually watch more YouTube than Netflix, but Netflix 10 times as much as iPlayer. Um, the, the BBC at the 2015 license uh, charter review process said, we must prepare for the internet age. We must prepare for a streaming age. And to some extent they have, but not fully. We're still driven by linear logic. I mean, what uh, Marcus was just describing about hammocking, um, uh, current affairs programs between entertainment programs to make sure they are better watched. That kind of manipulative approach to the audience was was personified by uh, labelling all the people who ran the channels as controllers. Controllers. They were all the BBC One controller. Um, I was the controller of programs with Thames Television. I remember a time when there were only two channels and when World in Action and Panorama were scheduled opposite each other to maximize the audience for current affairs. Uh, then BBC Two turned up and scheduled a Western called Alias Smith and Jones and scooped up the whole audience because the audience weren't looking for current affairs, they were looking for choice and they wanted to exercise choice. Now we have the capacity in the digital age and the streaming age to exercise huge amounts of choice. Even free-to-air television viewers have a hundred channels to choose from. Even if they don't go down the Netflix route or the Amazon route or anything like that. And we have to tailor for that. We have to uh, think through how do we create content? How do we generate the funding for high-end content? One of the biggest crises that has afflicted British television in recent years uh, has been the collapse of funding for what's called high-end television. 
uh, which is largely drum. Um, it used to be that the five public service broadcasters between them funded 98 to 99% of all high-end television uh, budgets. Last year, it was 15% of UK originated drama. 15% was funded directly by the public service broadcasters because they can't afford to compete because in the streaming age where the big streamers are global, uh, they can afford to spend five, 10 million pounds a year per, uh, sorry, five to 10 million pounds per episode on drama. Uh, ITV, Channel 4 and the BBC average 750,000 pounds an hour on drama. So inevitably, we get left behind unless you lock into a more dynamic funding mechanism, we will simply recede further and further in terms of relevance. Just to pick up, um, and by, by all means, Lindsay, if Lindsay Marks want to come up on that. I guess the, a few, you know, kind of almost to follow up on that uh, is we're talking a lot about funding models, but in some ways, this whole discussion was provoked by politics, you know, external politics, the politics of the Conservative Party, and the, the sense that the BBC is something that there is kind of Operation Red Meat to save Boris Johnson could involve something like, you know, the, the culture sector, Nadine Doris tweeting out that there's not going to be another licence fee. And, you know, is this, is, this, is this one of the reasons, do you think, that this almost talking about what public service broadcasting could and should look like so difficult, is that in this country it feels very political, as you can tell from my accent, I'm not from this country originally, and it feels particularly uh, political in this country, you know, in ways that I, I've still, I've worked in public sector broadcasting, over my career as well, and I've you know I've struggled to find figure out just why it's so political. And Lindsay, is, you know, is that something that you think is playing into this? Yes, I do. So obviously, really, and I think you know Marcus's point that we can't just think of the BBC in isolation. It's not just about the BBC. It's about the whole idea of of a space that isn't for sale, if you like, that isn't commercial, that doesn't belong to Murdoch or to. Um, Oh, Liberty Global, or doesn't doesn't belong to anybody but us, and that includes Channel Four, and it includes ITV, and the ecosystem is so important. And I think, I think, um, <clears throat> I might be wrong, but I don't think so. That this government, in particular, which is is quite a, a market oriented, doesn't believe that there should be a public space, and I think it's incredibly important that we protect that public space against ideology. Because really and truly, I mean, I, I see what David is talking about, the, the, the structures, but really and truly, if you don't commit to a public space, which is ours, not governments, then we're in deep trouble, deep trouble particularly because the other thing that's changed in the last 10 years or, or almost less is we're in a disinformation age. And I don't think that that was foreseen really in 2005, it wasn't foreseen by Peacock. And, and somehow we have, to, we have to think, how do we get clean information? How do we get clean discussion, um, reasonable discussion to, to our citizenry? And I think that's, that's another point, but I think the BBC is perfectly equipped to be part of that discussion, absolutely. Marcus, I might bring out, sorry. <laughs> David? Sorry, that all I was going to say was, in terms of uh, serving the domestic needs of the British public uh, in provision of news, current affairs, uh, etc., the BBC, I think, has a pretty good record. Uh, it's not excellent, but it's pretty good. Um, it's been sharpened up by the arrival uh, of competitors like Sky until Sky News turns up the BBC wouldn't have dreamt of offering a 24-hour news service, even though it absolutely could, because it didn't want to, and it didn't have to. And because it had a quasi-monopoly, nobody could force it to. So under pressure, the BBC can deliver excellent public service content, but it shouldn't be left to the BBC to decide how much of its budget it wants to spend on public service content and how much on entertainment content to maintain audience share and audience reach which need to be maintained in order to justify the license fee, which is a kind of wrong way round to run any kind of broadcasting, including British broadcasting and the British Broadcasting Corporation. So I would love to see 
a public service broadcasting commission being created, uh, rather like the university grants uh, commission, uh, funded, ring fenced by parliament, five years ring fencing, um, probably a billion pound fund, big chunk of it uh, dedicated initially to maintain certain types of BBC output, but progressively more and more contestable so that anyone can bid to the public service broadcasting fund, which is what they have in Ireland, they have in New Zealand, they have in Singapore. It's a well-established model. And you get people who are committed to public service content and the preservation of what Lindsay has just described, the public space for our public. Uh, ring fence from political interference, ring fence from commercial pressures, and dedicated to delivering just that type of content the market either cannot deliver or can't deliver in enough quantity. That's how I would go about this problem. And because we always turn it into the BBC or not the BBC, we miss the point. The BBC isn't the answer to this problem. Um, we are 42 minutes in and, you know, you know me and I haven't said the D word yet. So let's talk about diversity for a second, right? Which is interestingly, Lindsay used the term public space, which is ours. The issue, as I said, I'm currently in Glasgow right now, right? Is that lots of people in Scotland feel that that public space is not there. So that's what the whole debate was. You know, lots of um, black and Asian people feel that they are not included in that public space. And so I think what is vital, and I completely agree with Lindsay that it's important to have a public space which is ours, as opposed to the government's. That's the difference between a national broadcaster and a state broadcaster. But the issue is, is that do we have a public space which the, which the majority of the country feels is, or not even the majority, sorry, that there are large parts of the country and large parts of the population that don't feel it's theirs, you know? And so we, we need to strive for that. The other thing that, um, the other role of the BBC that we need to recognize is the ecosystem, that the BBC is a, um, creates, is such a major player that it creates the environment which other broadcasters play in. And so Channel 4 going out currently to the nations and regions and setting up a headquarter outside, that wouldn't have been possible if the BBC hadn't done it, hadn't done so in 2007. It was the infrastructure and the public money that was put into out of London productions yeah. and building that capacity that then enables other broadcasters to do that as well. Right? And so I think it's also vital in these discussions to be critical of the BBC and say, what else should the BBC be doing to ensure healthy ecosystem as well as looking at the reverse of if we get rid of the BBC or if we cut the BBC how will that affect the ecosystem you know so sometimes we only seem to frame it in a negative of if we reduce the BBC what are things we are missing we also need to frame it in the positive of what should we be demanding of the BBC and how that public money is spent in order to either build the infrastructure or build a public space which is ours and what have you. Because sometimes I, again, I feel that we're in this strange duality, the strange binary of, you know, save the BBC against these horrible attackers or burn the BBC down and a curse on all your houses, you know, and it's, and it's a, not a useful um, debate. Yeah, I agree. We also it's, have... It's, sorry, sorry just, Liz. You know, I was just going to say the other thing we haven't talked about is the 30% cut in funding of the BBC over the last 10 years. And, and the idea that, so that they've been forced into a slightly defensive mode rather than thinking, how do we expand? How do we do, how are we innovative? And I think that's very important um, that, that it's been that, that huge a cut by really quite vengeful governments. Just to pick up actually, there's one of the questions that came in from our readers, Akbar was asking like, you know, in some ways it's kind of overshadowed our whole thing, our whole conversation. You, do you think the world still needs the BBC? And I think that that feels like, you know, it feels like that's kind of the nub of this question. And even to speak to, to Marcus's point, 
does the world need this BBC or does it need a different version of the B, of this BBC? You know, as, as someone who lived in Glasgow for many years and, and is aware that the, 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 the metrocentrism of the BBC is a real thing and, and the, the diversity of voices and the lack of diversity of voices is a real thing. I, mean, I guess I feel like that, that seems to be the question I, I feel like I'm, at the end of this discussion we're coming back to. So are there market failures and market gaps in broadcasting that need to be filled and should be filled through um, uh, public funds. Absolutely, right? There is no doubt about that. Then we go into the debate of, is it the BBC that should fill this? And if so, how should it be filled? You know, and I suspect that um, uh, it's a very hard debate to have because it is so politicized that the current shape of the BBC and its current model of what it's delivering um, I would change personally. You know, I think that the market gaps now with the collapse of local journalism and advertising revenue means that there might be a bigger role for the BBC to play in local and regional content than it did in the past. And with the growth of Netflix and other larger international players, there might be a smaller role for the BBC to play in some high-end dramas or, or whatever. I'm watching Loki the other day. Sorry, um, it's embarrassing to admit, right? But the, the new Marvel on Disney, and that's Doctor Who, basically, yeah. right? I mean, it's, and the, so I can see that we're saying, well, it's uh, American, so we don't have the same cultural references and, and what have you, you know, but, you know, it, it's basically a remaking of Doctor Who. And so, as such, should the BBC be doing exactly what it's doing now? I, I doubt it. But... As um, David has pointed out, when the BBC is put under real pressure and competition, the BBC is really good at reinventing itself mm. and is really good at coming up with new models. Mm. The question is, how do we incentivize the BBC to come up with those new models and, the, and to be the best BBC it can be? And simply defending it in all warts and all is not the way for us to get the best out of the BBC or the best way to get the best out of public service broadcasting, in my opinion. Well, it is, it is one way of doing it. I mean, I agree with you and I, I want to see BBC. I mean, I was thinking tonight that actually what the BBC should be doing is they should have a daily program on COVID, long COVID, or you know, they should be doing their public service um, uh, broadcasting remit with that. But um, I think we have to, I mean, defending it, it's, it's awful to be in this position of defending it vigorously against the really hostile government. I think we've got to look at what the government is doing and why is it, why is it intent on, on cutting back the BBC, um, making the BBC afraid, um, threatening the BBC, why is it doing that? This is, you know, at a time like this, it's the opposite of what we should be doing in terms of regionalism, diversity, information, clean information. Um, I think it's it's hard for it's, the BBC to be innovative when they're under such pressure from a hostile government. Well, they're under pressure because of their funding mechanism. Uh, that's the simple truth of the matter and, and will be as long as they cling to it. I mean, bear in mind that in uh, 2010, the BBC volunteered to freeze the licence fee and did so for six years because it thought it had to make its own contribution to uh, recovery from the economic crisis of 2008. So a two-year freeze of the license fee is neither new uh, nor particularly threatening in those terms. My personal feeling is that it was, it was quite wrong of the Conservative government to force the BBC out of the license fee to fund S4C, World Service Radio, local television, uh, broadband rollout, all these things which are government projects, nothing to do with the BBC as such. And the BBC should have just said no. Unfortunately, they had bitten, uh, uh, taken a bite out of the cherry 10 years earlier when they insisted on paying for uh, the rollout of digital terrestrial television and funding out of the license fee uh, the uh, costs of assisting people who 
had trouble converting to DTT from analog television. And they did that because they thought, we're going to get an increase in the license fee. This will all be over and we'll keep all of that money. So the BBC has sold the pass itself so many times in the past. It's hard to have that much sympathy now. And by the way, when Nadine Doris, who knows as much about broadcasting as I guess the average bus driver does, uh, when she says this will be the last negotiation over the license fee, the BBC should have been cheering from the rafters saying, thank God we don't have to deal with this stupid woman anymore. Uh, we don't have to deal with any of them ever again. What a fantastic so release. I mean, to get back to the original premise about what will it look like in 20 uh, Thank you very much, Lindsay. I was going to give all of you about 15 seconds each to, to get back to the original premise and give us, give us what you think. So, Lindsay, please start me off with that. I, I think that if we're to have the BBC that I want, which is, reflects what Marcus has said and to some extent what David said, maybe not so much, um, I would like to see a, an independent, um, completely independent of government commission or body which would actually set a funding model for the BBC, which would be an end of it, so that we were not in the hands of Nadine Doris or anybody else in, in, in the government. So that's, I think that's the major thing. But I do, I do that against the backdrop of thinking that we are, would be literally insane to think that the BBC has outlived its usefulness or should be broken up or should enter the commercial market. I think all of that is, would be terribly, terribly damaging for us and for the country. David, I'm going to give you, I'm going to be tight on your disc. I'm going to give you 20 seconds. Okay. Well, look, the BBC is heavily into the commercial market already. Uh, it's selling commercial programs overseas. It runs commercial subscription and advertising channels in this country. So there's nothing uh, to be alarmed about there. What I would like to see is a BBC which is much more devolved than it is, where BBC Scotland has far more devolved power, where radio is far more devolved from television, where the World Service is back where it should belong as an independent organisation, and where the BBC is free to split its content into the correct pools, get public funding from a public service broadcasting commission for its public service content, and conquer the world with its commercial products. Marcus, thank you very much, David. Marcus, the last word to you. I think the BBC needs to be funded um, progressively. So however people pay for it, the small um, pensioner on, min not minimum wage, on a tiny pension should not be paying the same as David pays. Um, and so I think we need to look at progressive ways of paying for the BBC. And I think we need to have a proper debate as to what are the market gaps and failures, which are not the same as they were 10 years ago and not the same as they were 20 years ago. And the BBC and public service broadcasting needs to make sure that they address those gaps as well as possible. Thank you very much. A huge thanks to all of my audience who turned up today. Thanks for listening. Particular thanks to Lindsay, David and Marcus. It's been a really interesting discussion. We've got down into some of these issues. They're naughty as hell, as we can tell. There's a lot going on with them. And I think these, to me, feel like the kind of conversations we need to be having about the future public broadcasting. You know, taking it out of a kind of, uh, of, of, of and somebody's taking it out of the politics as well, and pulling it out and going, what is, what do we need from public broadcasting? What works, what doesn't work? And I think this has been a really, really insightful. For me, I've learned a lot as well. I hope you all have too. Um, so thanks again to everybody. We have a weekly debate, so well as well as bi-weekly at this stage. You can check out our website and our social media for the details or go to opendemocracy.net uh, and click on live discussions. And of course, Open Democracy relies on contributions, donations, to support our journalism. So if you want to see more public interest journalism like this, this kind of conversations and the work that we do at Open Democracy, please do consider giving us your support. You can support us at support.opendemocracy.net forward slash donate. I just want to say thank you all again, and I look forward to seeing many of you next time. And thanks again to the wonderful panel. Thanks, Peter. Thank you so thank much. You